excited about that. Me too, because uh, this is definitely, I mean, you thought Hillary and Trump, uh, that election was uh, contested. This one, I mean, wow. Pretty fun. Uh, 827, let's head over to the uh, K-Wave News Zoom room where we have standing by from the Department of Public Health and uh, Social Services, the PIO, Janella Carrera. Good morning, Janella. Hey, good morning, Chris and Bree. Nice to see you both. Good morning. Um, let's, let's go over how the uh, public hearing went. Um, I didn't get to see it live, but I got to watch a part of the repeat on, on the governor's uh, Facebook page. So how was the, the turnout? Yeah, you know, um, so we had about uh, 20, about 20 people in the Zoom room, and that includes actually the staff of public health. Uh, we had about four senators um, who also appeared in the Zoom room. That was namely Senator Will Castro, Senator Peter Terlahi, uh, chairwoman on the Committee of Health, Senator uh, Therese Terlahi, and we also had Senator Talo Taidegui. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I noticed. Had, of course, some members of the committee. Yeah. I noticed that the senators, they were like, oh, I'm just here to watch. I'm just here to listen. And I, maybe they'll provide testimony on, on during Wednesday's uh, hearing. But what was, uh, I guess, the consensus from the people that, that, that testified? What sort of concerns did they, they had? You know, I think most of the concerns that were raised by members of the community were, um, it, we had some members that raised concerns about the fines, and especially now that, uh, you know, we have a high unemployment rate yeah. and the affordability of it. Uh, we also had some concerns about the applicability of it, uh, who would be enforcing it. We had concerns from people who um, were also just, uh, you know, wanting to talk about the pandemic as a whole and not necessarily about the draft uh, enforcement rules. Um, actually, Senator Castro uh, testified as well. Um, yeah. I know some senators said they were just there to observe, but Senator Castro actually did speak, and his concern was that the legislature wasn't involved in the process. So I did want to mention that. Mm -hmm. um, we had uh, some some uh, members of the public who raised concerns just, um, you know, about the fact that, you know, we're seeing numbers still continuing to rise. Um, concerns about people not being properly educated and um, they may not be fully aware of what the guidances and directives are out there. And, you know, in the event that they may um, not be wearing their mask properly or just not properly aware of what the uh, violations may be, and they may actually be in violation and not be fully aware of it. So uh, suggesting that maybe more education needs to be done. So those were some of the concerns that were raised during the public hearing. Mm -hmm. You know, there was something you said, Will Castro, uh, there was something that the senator said that I wanted to ask you about because I hadn't heard anything about it officially, about uh, this, uh, he had been hearing about the possibility of some sort of a, a island-wide lockdown, a 48-hour, I think I want to say, he said, uh, a lockdown, mm -hmm. something that he had heard in I'm not sure where he heard it from, but uh, is that something that the Department of Public Health is uh, looking at or suggesting or recommending? No, and I'm not sure where he heard that from. Uh, there's there's no um, island-wide lockdown that, that's being suggested or um, we've had no discussions of such uh, island-wide lockdown, 48 hours. I, I've not, at least for me, I've not heard of that. Mm -hmm. If that's a discussion that was made, I'm not part of that, and I'm, I'm certainly not aware of it. Okay, thanks, for, thanks for that clarification. Because I was like, wait, anybody hear about this? And I was blowing up our chat, wondering, okay, what did we miss? Where did this come from? So, so thank you for for right. that. And if, if 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 I did hear about it, I would definitely want to be a part of that conversation. <laughs> so, yeah. So uh, I wanted to ask about uh, we talked to Maria about uh, gathering of, uh, you know, candidates and their supporters at the different uh, polling sites. Um, she said it was a problem at uh, when they did the satellite voting. What's the department's role in uh, kind of enforcing that um, gathering thing or does it even apply if it's for elections? Well, you know, the. 
the executive order and the public health guidance does state that the limit on social gatherings is uh, five, up to five people. So that does apply uh, during an election uh, at polling sites. Um, so that applies even at polling sites. If there are gatherings um, of more than five people, then that would be a potential violation, or that is a violation of the executive order. Um, so we do encourage um, candidates to abide by that uh, guideline of that in the executive order and the public health directives. Mm -hmm. So if they do want to campaign um, and they're out there in the polling sites, greeting voters, uh, entering a polling site, we ask that they stay within those guidelines. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to go back to the uh, uh, enforcement and the fines. So when this is, uh, I guess, adopted by, uh, I guess, public health, right? Is it adopted by public health or, or the governor's office? These fines and fees. Um, so they are issued if there are violations of the governor's executive orders and directives and guidance from public health. Uh, is it just for what's currently in place or the date of the adoption of these rules and regs? Or say, for example, if the governor a week from now uh, says, well, I'm going to implement all these other uh, stepped up uh, prohibitions. Does it just, is it just a blanket fines and fees for whatever comes down? So the way that the, um, the public health enforcement rules uh, reads, um, I believe it's in one of the sections here, it says, uh, declared in executive order number 2020-03 or any extension thereof. So it would be the current existing executive order, an extension of that executive order, um, public health guidances and directives. Um, so existing uh, policies, executive orders, guidances and directives. And then if, if there's an extension of that particular executive order, um, it would be applicable to that. But then of course, you know, that's the reason why we have the public hearing, because we do want to hear from the community. We want to uh, hear what their concerns and issues are. And we do we do take into consideration uh, what their concerns are. And we do intend to refine, um, you know, what the public health enforcement rules are mm -hmm. with public input as well. Okay. Um, so that's the reason why this is called draft. Okay. Um, so the way it reads right now is, this the the base executive order the, the first executive order and extension of that the current existing public health guidances and directives um and whatever extension occurs uh, after um if this public health uh enforcement rule is adopted so what's next so there's another hearing a virtual hearing wednesday right so how do people uh how are they going to be able to participate Right, so we do have a, another public hearing, a virtual public hearing on Wednesday, November 4th from 2 to 4 p.m. And that's also via Zoom. We did issue the Zoom link to our media partners. Uh, we also have it um, being advertised in both papers. Um, as you know, Zoom has a limit of 100 participants, which is why we th there's a limitation on it, but we do intend to um, put it on Facebook Live and we will post it uh, as well after the, the live, um, uh, or I'm sorry, after the public hearing, we will post it on our Facebook page and YouTube account. Um, we also set up a, um, a, an email address for those who want to submit written testimony as well. That's publichealth at dphss.guam.gov and we're accepting written testimony until November 4th at 4 p.m. Um, after we, you know, we complete the public hearing and um, receive all the written testimony, uh, you know, we'll take into consideration all the public testimony, all the public comments that we've received, uh, refine the public health enforcement draft rules. We'll, um, you know, take it back to the table, you know, get the uh, governor's uh, concurrence and then adopt the draft rules and uh, then we'll provide copies to all three branches of government. When When is the, uh, wait, first you said the deadline for written testimony is also Wednesday, 4 p.m., right? 
Okay. And how soon are you looking? Right, right. which is uh, at the Do you have any timeline on when you anticipate adopting these rules and regs? Um, well, as you know, the AAA process allowed for, you know, an expedient process. So, you know, we're looking, hopefully, because the, the, the timeline, um, the uh, re receiving of the public comment would be November 4th, 4 p.m. Um, you know, we intend to look over the, all the comments, um, use that to guide us in refining the draft rules. Um, I'm not sure how long that process would take okay. based upon how many comments we received, both oral and written. Um, it may take a few days mm -hmm. to go through that. Um, and then, you know, we, we go to the governor's office, to the governor with her concurrence based upon uh, re uh, amending or re um, refining the draft rules. And then, um, you know, from there we move forward in providing uh, whatever the finalized version of the draft rules would be and provide copies to the legislature, the judiciary, and of course the governor's office. Okay. Um, can we talk about the executive the, branch? Right. Can we talk about the um, the community testing that was postponed? Do you guys have any new date yet on uh, when it will be rescheduled for da da da? Uh, as of this time, we don't have a new date. Uh, we do intend to meet with the mayor's office, the FSM consulate office, and the FSM Association of Guam to discuss the uh, new possible date. For community testing, we, you know, we did have some registrants um, for that initial date that we had from this past Saturday. Um, I don't know if it'll be this weekend, maybe next weekend, but we do want to proceed with a, a, a new date. So we'll come back to the table, discuss a possibility of a new date. All right. And of course, we will announce it. Yes. All right. Uh, anything else? No. Thank you, Janella. <laughs> uh, oh, what, what about weekend testing? I saw that. Uh, Thank no, you. That... Go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, I just want to repeat again and remind everybody about the virtual hearing this coming Wednesday. We do urge the community to participate. We want to hear from them. This is important to us, and uh, it's important that we hear from the community about these draft rules. This is not something that we're taking lightly. Um, you know, we understand the, the potential ramifications. This is, this is a, a, you know, this, we understand the burden that this could place in the community. Mm -hmm. So we want and we urge participation from the community, whether it's through oral testimony or submission of written testimony. And that's uh, through the email that we set up. And again, I just want to repeat the email in case, you know, uh, people might not have heard it the first time. And that's publichealth at dphss dot guam dot gov and we'll be posting that um, on our uh, social media accounts and we did uh, provide that email address to our media partners as well mm -hmm. um and i'm sorry you you had a question oh just about the uh weekend uh testing can you just tell us a little bit anything uh, extra i know we saw a, a nine positives out of a hundred uh tests on saturday right a total of 141 uh right. positives uh since friday night uh, out of 1,178 samples that were run. So that was 111 uh, based on the JIC yesterday, the day before, mm. 423, and then 644 Friday night. Are the, Were these uh, contact, right. you know, close contacts? Saw, or? Yeah, you know, when we, when, when we saw the nine positives out of 111, it, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a it's a decent number to see. Um, it's when you calculate it based on a rate, it's about eight percent, which we've been averaging about you know 12, 13 percent. But I wouldn't look at that number alone mm -hmm. because you have to look at other rates, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. We're still seeing high numbers at GMH mm -hmm. uh, of of um, the COVID census. So um, it, it may be an encouraging sign, um, but we're definitely not out of the woods when we're still seeing um, 
patients, you know, a, a hospital that's reaching its critical point. Right. Mm-hmm. So I would caution people, right? I would caution people to to not look at that number and think our our rates are going down or we're anywhere near where we want to be. Mm-hmm. So it, it may it may be an encouraging sign, but mm-hmm. I would not look at that and think that we're anywhere near where we want to be. Right. You know, since we do have you on, um, I I might as well just follow up and ask whether or not the Department of Public Health is actually looking at any violations of protocols uh, or any bypassing of protocols that occurred at the government isolation facility with respect to uh, Congressman Michael St. Nicholas's admission. Is something that Adeloup had uh, kind of alleged. Right. Right. You know, first, I do want to say that, um, you know, I, I, I am aware that um, the congressman did post on his Facebook page and, you know, revealed that he was ill. Um, I know that he um, mentioned that he was admitted to GMH uh, and then later was discharged. So I, I do wish for his speedy and full recovery. Um, and, um, you know, without mentioning and going into details due to potential uh, HIPAA violations, uh, it is something that the, the department is looking into. Yeah. Well, I mean, you can um, you can go back and watch our uh, interview, no. Janelle. We did an interview with him, and he said that he called his sister-in-law, which was, I guess, part of the allegation that was made. Right. I, I know that he did talk about it, um, you know, but, you know, that that's... That's his prerogative to reveal the details, but from our end, uh, we're, we're still need to maintain, um, you know, personal uh, privacy of health rights. Um, right, but right. it is something the department is looking into. Mm-hmm. Any potential um, uh, breach of protocol. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yes, the department is looking into that. So then, can you just kind of go over the, I guess, the protocols to gain admission into yeah. the government isolation facility? For people who don't have a sister-in-law in the system. Okay, yeah. Well, I, I, one thing I do want to make clear, I, one thing I do want to make absolutely clear is that the isolation facility is for patients who have been diagnosed uh, with COVID-19. That is absolutely clear. You, you cannot be uh, admitted or taken to the isolation facility unless you have been diagnosed with COVID-19. There is a quarantine facility for patients, or I'm sorry, for travelers who are coming into Guam. And then the isolation facility is for those who've been diagnosed with COVID-19. The other thing is, you know, typically we do an assessment of those who've been diagnosed with COVID-19. And when a patient is diagnosed with COVID-19, a member of our isolation team will make contact with uh, a patient and we'll make arrangements, you know, they assess their home, the suitability of their home, their family situation, and we'll make arrangements for transport. On occasion, we've had instances, and I just wanna make this a point of clarification, we've had instances in which uh, a patient who may not be able to wait um, for a member of the isolation team to contact them because maybe their situation at home may be so dire Mm-hmm. that you know they they realize you know what i don't have a suitable home right now and i just want to go into isolation now um you know they don't want to wait for that contact and they'll reach out to us directly and say hey can i be transported now um into isolation we've had situations like that right. um and, and in that case we will arrange for that transport or you know make arrangements with the patient directly so that has happened um but there is, you know, within within the mem- within our uh, isolation team, uh, there is a process for that. Mm-hmm. You you said diagnosed. Uh, this includes if you test positive, and if you are clinically diagnosed as a COVID nineteen patient. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. Clinically diagnosed, test positive, but also, you know, we have to have some sort of verifiable. Uh, clinical diagnosis. Did you have that in the congressman's uh, case, Janella? Are you allowed to say? Uh, uh, I'm not able to say anything about the congressman's case. Uh, 
again, it's, you know, I, I don't want to violate any type of personal um, health protected information. Other than uh, it is being looked into. Right, other than it's being looked into. All right, thank you, Janella. Good thank luck, you, make sure you get out of both. Stay safe. Yeah, wash your hands. I did, I put it already, thank you. Okay, <laughs> 847, uh, good morning.